Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to the third episode of What Comes Next. Today, we are here with Sasha. Sasha has been at Tudor Associates for 13 years, over which she has risen from director to vice president to CEO and studied 19th century literature and American studies at Barnard College and also was a writing fellow at Barnard. She's currently focused on providing holistic one-on-one -on -one education to middle school and high school students. Sasha, thank you so much for joining us. First and foremost, I hope everyone in your family as well. Thank you. Yes, they are. They're all having pizza downstairs. So hopefully no little children will come and, and uh, surprise us. But yes, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you guys so much. I think this is such a great idea. Thank you. Uh, so I guess to start off, um, how did uh, you get into what you do for a living? How did, how did you find that interest? So actually, I, like, you know, so many students needed a tutor in high school. I needed a calculus tutor. And the founder of Tutor Associates, David Oblast, was my tutor. And um, my parents just did not understand why I thought calculus tutoring was so fun. <laughs> but David made it fun. Um, I looked forward to learning with him. And I started to think about how important one-on-one -on -one education could be because all of a sudden math made sense to me. And then at Barnard, when I was a writing fellow, all of that was also modeled on this one-on-one -on -one relationship and the richness of that collaboration. And, and it's a very specific relationship that's quite different than a classroom um, environment. And, and I sort of fell in love with that model and the potential of it and all the things you could do when you had a strong relationship with another person. Um, so after college, I, I talked to David and I started working for Tutor Associates. And you know, since then, I've been really focused on developing all the things that kids and parents need so that their brains um, are ready to do all the things that they need to do um, as middle and high school students and obviously to get ready for college. Yeah, it's clear that um, your interest in helping students now, much of that came from your own experience as a high school student. What have you taken from that experience that you use now at Tudor Associates? Yeah, you know, I think um, there's a few things. The first is that, you know, as a student, I remember feeling frustrated when teachers wouldn't really model what they wanted. They would write, like, analyze more. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd love to analyze more. I don't know how to, um, right? Or they would um, they would just, and, and I felt frustrated with some of the, the stuff I was encountering in the classroom. And so when I had this really safe relationship with this one person, um, I felt like my brain could open up and I could learn in a different way. Um, so, so I think that part of it was my frustration in the classroom, but, but I think part of it was my understanding that when I felt completely focused on by a really wonderful human, um, I could learn more. So everything we do is centered on that relationship. You know, I, I think if you don't love your tutor, if you don't really, um, work well with the person who's in your home, I think the magic doesn't really happen. <laughs> but if you have someone you trust and you respect and who makes you laugh while you're learning calculus, um, I, I think the brain opens up and is able to do all sorts of things it's not normally able to do. And I saw that happen for myself and I try to bring that to everything our tutors do with our students. Yeah, so kind of to that, the purpose for tutors of course is to help cope with just struggles in class do you think that is at all maximized during this quarantine and if so how do you suggest coping with that extra level of stress or uh, problems learning yes well i think that um a few things first of all teenagers are going through an unprecedented time it's incredibly difficult and the most important thing for us is that our teenagers are healthy and that they are tending to their emotional well-being um, because this is a really challenging time. And tutoring fits in on that in kind of two different ways. One is that um, I only hire people who I want to be around the kids we tutor. These are compassionate, curious, kind, um, thoughtful humans. And I think that they are an important support system for their students during this time. Um, because they know them and they don't judge them and they're there to help them. Um, I also think, you know, the best tutors have adapted quickly. Um, we always worked with remote students. We have students abroad and we have students in boarding schools. Um, but even so, we had to really ramp up all of the tools we're using online to support our students. And we've had to make sure we know that, you know, students at this school are doing this and 
students at the school or do Google, Google Classroom, and we have to be good at both of those things. Um, and so we've definitely ramped up our training for online support, um, and we've done lots of workshops to help or support our tutors. Um, and that, that's how we can best support our kids as they're working remotely. Is it optimal? Um, I think it really depends on the student. Um, for some kids, this offers so much flexibility and so much more time in their schedule, which is something so many of you are lacking. And for others, it's a real struggle to be in front of the screen so much or to use these tools um, remotely. And speaking to what you said about remote learning, um, obviously schooling across the world has changed drastically this year. Um, you know, schools across our country, across the world, they had to implement this, implement this remote learning system that so many students um, have no idea how to adapt to. Um, and it's shaken up a lot of their uh, learning careers. And for students like us who are about to enter the college process, what does this mean for the future of academia? Yeah, well, gosh, that is an incredible question. Um, and it's the question everyone would like to be able to answer. I think that there are some positive outcomes for this, and I think there are some really sad outcomes. Um, the saddest outcome for me is that learning together is a beautiful thing. Um, and, you know, that happens in a room near each other, particularly for younger children, but for older children as well. So I think there's a real loss in, in that um, sort of uh, the learning that can take place when you can see someone's face better and you can read the room and you can, I think that's important. But um, this sort of remote learning has started to make us question um, some of the old fashioned deliveries of education, some of the ways we can make education uh, more equitable through technology, um, some of the things that can be done effectively without being in person. And, and it's sort of begged the question, um, why is college so expensive if it can be delivered remotely? Um, and the colleges are going to have to reckon with that <laughs> in the coming year. Um, the, you know, as you know, Harvard is going part remote and uh, Princeton is going part remote and a lot of students won't be on campus this fall. And so um, we're, we're gonna have to wait and see what the impact on higher education is. Yeah, so in addition to that, um, another big thing that's coming up now is the whole test optional policy. And I was just wondering if, if you kind of knew, you know, what does this really mean for students entering Absolutely. college? So there's sort of um, three categories of schools. There's the schools who were already test optional, like Bowdoin. So we're gonna talk about them in a second. There are the schools that are temporarily test optional, like Harvard. Um, because of COVID. And then there are the schools like Tufts that are test optional in a sort of trial run three year. They're going to test some things out and see, right? Um, so the, the big picture is that test optional means we'd love to see great scores. <laughs> um, you know, our kids have been sending amazing SAT and ACT scores to Bowdoin for as long as it's been test optional and Bowdoin is happy to see those scores. What it means though, is that if you cannot produce scores that are going to be competitive at a school like Bowdoin, it, it won't be held against you in the admissions process. And a small school like Bowdoin can genuinely do that. They can really get to know uh, each applicant and they're a small enough school that test optional can be a meaningful thing. And you see that at some of the smaller liberal arts schools. Um, we say, if you have the scores, send them. If you don't, okay, don't worry about it. You, you kind of get off the hook. And most of our students need scores for some of the schools. This year, everything's different. I mean, pretty much no one is going to require scores um, from current rising seniors. Um, and they still want to see them. <laughs> they, they really wish they could require scores, but they're looking at the at the world and they're saying this isn't fair to kids. It's particularly unfair to kids who are of lower economic backgrounds and we just can't require it. And so if, if you wanted to go to Georgetown and you didn't want to take subject tests, this could be your year. And if you have an amazing stellar academic record, but Harvard was off the table because of standardized testing, this could be the year. Um, but if you can send superb scores, all of those schools would like to see them. Um, and so that's sort of, it's sort of a, um, a risk tolerance thing, you know, how good are the scores, how much work is going to go into them, and then how important are they. And then for the schools that are moving away from them, like Tufts um, or the UC schools, I mean, they're just going to replace it with other things. These, 
there are just too many applicants for how many spots there are. Um, you know, when there are 20,000 applicants, you need a way to standardize things and those things are never going to be perfect. Um, and so they'll develop their own ways to figure out which candidates are, are ready. But you'll hear the wide majority of schools stand by these tests, which is a surprise to me because I don't think they're um, of great value, but the schools do. And many will, will want to see fantastic scores, whether or not they're test optional. And even before this test optional policy has become so popular, many people have been questioning the SAT and the ACT. Um, what do you see for the future of those tests after this year? Well, we ha they have to survive this year first. So if they survive this year, I think they'll be okay in the near term because um, they've had a real monopoly, the two of them, the SAT and then now both, have had a real monopoly on sort of the um, standardized testing, college admissions landscape. These are private companies. Um, it's sort of outrageous how much power they have in terms of kids' lives and the futures of kids. And um, if they're not able to deliver in-person testing this fall, that's going to be really, really hard for them. Um, and then the next step for them is to figure out if they can go online in an equitable way. Because I think online testing has been coming for a long time. And now the question is, can you do it at home safely? If not, can you get testing centers together that are safe and Enough and equitable enough so that everyone can test. And if they can do that, I think most schools will continue to want to see a test like this. Um, and others, like the UC schools, will just create their own steep test. That's another standardized test that you have to learn if you want to apply to those schools. So, you know, as so long as we have too few spots for too many great applicants, you're going to need standardized testing to sort through them. And the question is, which companies will be producing those tests and what will those tests look like. And 10 years ago, very few New York City kids took the ACT. So in 10 years, maybe there'll be other tests that they'll take with more frequency. But for now, if they can survive this fall, I, I think in the, in the next five years, they're not going anywhere, despite their huge problems. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely like understand that, like why schools are going test optional because even I've experienced it. Like I've had kind of two uh, nightmare like scenarios where I had places at locations and it w fell through. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a challenge. It is. And they're going to be looking for what, whatever kids can make of this really difficult time. That's what they're looking for. Colleges, they just know. I mean, they, if you can't safely test, or if not enough people can safely test that it's not fair, they're just not going to require it. Um, and you've seen that across the board that they don't. And they still haven't moved their deadlines and they still haven't generally reduced tuition, though Princeton has a little bit, um, but they certainly are going to be really forgiving on the test testing side. Yeah, so, so to that, you know, um, the remote learning is obviously like inevitable at this point. So how long do you do you think it's going to go on? And, and you talked a little bit about how like uh, your tutors will obviously and have been adapting, but how do you how do you see a sufficient way for the students and teachers to to have a successful semester if, if this goes on? Sure. You know, um, the private schools are, are somewhat lucky. Um, they have a lot of flexibility and, and usually the finances to spend a lot of time over the summer getting things right. I think most of the independent and boarding schools have kind of acknowledged that the spring was bumpy and put together as quickly as we could in a crisis, but that the fall will be much better. Um, I think public school teachers are going to have a really hard time. Um, and I think we have a public health question about whether or not I, teachers should be in the building. Um, but I think we're going to kind of try to do, I think we're going to see schools mitigate risk, not get rid of it. I think if you're talking about kids coming together, you're talking about some risk. So we're going to see people mitigate the rest, risk through social distancing and having fewer bodies in the buildings and some remote. And, and the remote learning has to get better. It has to get more organized. It has to get more interactive. It has to get more, um, and it has to give students breaks from the screen. Um, and I think the private schools should and will be able to do that, um, hopefully this fall for the sake of all of our kids. Um, for you personally at um, Tudor Associates, what have you seen be some reasons as to why remote learning at home um, is less productive than it is in person? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many things. So when we work with our students, fatigue, anxiety, distractibility, this is what it is to work with learners, right? And so when you're next to someone and you can sort of see them fading or, you know, and you can kind of hand them a little snack or you can nudge them or make a joke, I think some of those things are harder to do online. I think they're harder to notice online sometimes. And it's really important to us as educators to to be present with our students and know what they're going through in sessions. But um, fortunately, we have great technology. And I think um, from our students' perspective, not much has changed with their tutors. A lot more has changed with their schoolwork um, because you can more easily recreate that one-on-one -on -one thing than you can a school um, classroom. And um, so, so I think kids that are telling us that either their teachers are not adapting enough for their needs at home. They're on the screen way too much. Um, they have too much downtime on the other side. Some, some students are saying they're just barely online and they're just kind of listless. So we're gonna have to find that balance for kids where they have that break they need, but that they have direction and focus and individual attention. Yeah, and as a student myself who went through this, I'm sort of out of nowhere having to just jump right into remote learning something that I very much noticed was that my motivation to get on the computer every day and listen to my teachers um, was declining um, very quickly. Um, what are some ways that that specifically students can find ways to cope with? Yeah, so um, that's across the board. We're seeing motivation levels go, go way down. I mean, lots of schools went past fail. I know not everyone did. Um, that hurt a lot of motivation. And also just not getting to see your friends and having all the lively um, discussions and the, and the in-person interactions. So big problem for our kids. Um, so there's a lot of different things. I think some of them are short-term and some of them are long-term. So if you're going for a really short-term thing that you have to get done that you hate doing, um, then you should use an external motivator. So what is the thing you love most? You wanna watch a little TV, you wanna eat a little cupcake, something that's really, really um, about short-term gratification. And that's good for short-term things you have to push through, but that's not gonna get you out of bed every morning and that's not gonna get you through the really long paper or the really hard class. Um, and so for those, I think it's important to um, a, dig really deep into focusing on what you do want. You want to get the grades or you want to learn the information or you want to get a good recommendation. Whatever the motivation, I don't judge it, but you have some true thing you want that is connected to that class, even if it's just the grade or even if it's just that you want to get into calc next year so you have to learn pre-calc. And writing those things down and focusing really intensely on the goals when you're feeling unmotivated, those things help a lot. I'm also a big fan of working out. I think a seven minute workout, some push ups, some anything but lying down can really help um, it with motivation. Um, and again, I think those little external rewards need to be in place too because you guys are going through a lot and it's very hard to be motivated in this world. And so, you know, we're saying if I get three paragraphs done, I can take a 15 minute break and look on Instagram or whatever, those kind of deals. As long as you keep your deal with yourself and you write those three paragraphs, I think those can be useful too. Um, and in the long run, we're going to have to look at the impact of all of this on our, on our young people. Um, you know, uh, this is a very hard time to be a young person, to be anxious about the world and not know when you're going to return to the life that you guys all wanted to return to. Um, and so I think this is also a time to dig deep and look at the things that are, are, are not feeling right and note them and reflect on them and not be so hard on yourself because um, colleges will uh, be looking for that kind of reflection this fall. And the question is, what did you do when you weren't motivated? Well, you guys started a podcast, so I think you're in good shape. But, um, but what do you do when things are hard? You're, you're not always going to feel motivated. So what do you do? Um, and I think a lot of it is pushing through those moments with little external rewards and then reminding yourself what's deeply important to you about doing the work. Yeah, I definitely think what's kind of tied to the motivation, as you're saying, is uh, procrastination. And I think also as we see this rise in, uh, you know, a lot of free time that there's inevitably that's inevitably going to happen and might stir some people crazy so i think one way to kind of cope with that at least is, is kind of what you're saying the external motivation uh keeping yourself busy exercising uh, i know me and jack uh both love to bike and that's definitely something that's like 
you know, a rewarding, fun thing at the end of a day of working. So yeah, and I think, I think- yeah, I think kids and grownups too do a lot of like judging themselves when they're not motivated or when they are anxious or when they're feeling, you know, not great. And it's like, well, you know, you can try really hard to just be motivated. Just just tell yourself like, Jack, Ethan, just be more motivated, but it's never really worked. <laughs> so I think more importantly is it's like, okay, I'm not feeling so motivated. Okay, that's normal. I'm a human. This is awful. This is really tough what am I going to do? I'm going to take a little break or I'm going to write down my goals or I'm going to go for a bike ride or I'm going to tell someone I'm feeling unmotivated or I'm going to um, bribe myself with some cupcakes, (laughs) whatever it is. Um, I think it's, it's worth not fighting it so much as working with it. Same thing goes for anxiety or distractibility. If you fight the anxiety, well, we know that that doesn't work. But if you can sit with the anxiety and breathe and witness it and be okay that it's there then it'll start to dissipate and this year is while it's also it's brought a pandemic it's also brought many many social issues to light that weren't necessarily talked about as much before um in the future do you see curriculums changing in schools to adapt to this i hope so um and and i think so yes and and as educators, we're thinking a lot about our role with students. How do we um, ask questions and open minds and open conversations and build bridges with our students so that they can become, um, you know, compassionate, thoughtful, um, interested people in the world as they become adults? And and um, so we've been thinking a lot about what what we can do both for our tutors and for our students. Um, and, and yes, I think schools are rightfully reckoning with long histories um, that have been you know, complicated um, and they're going to um, likely do some real work with their teachers and with their curriculum um, so that that curriculum reflects a more um, inclusive and, and uh, fair telling of the world we live in. So you seem so knowledgeable on all these topics we kind of have about anything regarding education and it just uh, uh brings up like the question like w- what does your like daily day entail like what, what do you do oh gosh well we'll leave out the fact that the baby thinks five fifteen is the time to wake up in the morning and then he wants to watch um like lullabies or something at five thirty. no um so my job is really um as ceo it's to make sure that the company is growing in a way that is healthy. I think of Tudor Associates as like an organism, this really vulnerable, very important to me, little thing of life. And if you let toxic things into it, it won't do so well. And if you infuse it with the right strategic things and the most positive things and the right people, it will grow, but it will grow in a really sustainable, healthy way. Um, So that's my job every year. (laughs) And this year, um, what that means is helping tutors who don't have as much work as they did all of a sudden, who maybe have partners, um, husbands and wives who have been laid off. So it means finding them meaningful work and making sure hours are there for them. Um, It's about navigating um, the right advice to give our clients. We very much want to spread positive, clear information and combat the fear that we know is everywhere for our kids and our parents. Um, And my day-to-day is meetings. I have Zoom meetings all day long, um, and they're with staff members, and they're with uh, tutors, and they're with families, um, and occasionally with other educators, heads of school, or ex-missions people. um, And sometimes we're planning projects and sometimes we're talking through um, how best to support our tutors and sometimes we're talking about unveiling better policies with our clients Um, but it's just meetings all day long and I miss having them in person Uh, but they're they happen via zoom and then the rest of the day is spent um, you know I think it slack is so important if you're going to innovate so if I don't have time to let things process in sort of the back of my mind nothing ends up moving forward so I try to do something uh, like weed my garden where things are just rolling around in the back of my mind and, and I take time to process things and then I come back to my team the next day uh, to, to sort of move those projects forward and to make sure our vision is in line with who we are, which right now, like everyone else, we're 
really looking at our processes and making sure we're comfortable with what they are. But going yeah, back to meetings and babies. That's my day. <laughs> yeah, just shifting back to um, the narrative about the SAT or the ACT, um, something that's been talked about heavily for a very long time, um, and now it's being discussed in a different light amidst remote learning, is ways to make sure that these tests are equitable for all students. Um, and amidst the pandemic right now, that's obviously that discussion is changing. Um, but as someone like yourself, who has such a high and influential position in a tutoring company like Tutor Associates, um, do you ever think about that? And do you ever think about ways that um, Tutor Associates itself can improve? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, um, you know, we work with mostly kids who have a lot of privilege, who have the money to pay for one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and who often go to the best schools in the country. And um, I'm proud of the work we do with them. I think those are the future leaders of our world in many ways, and I love working with them. And I think all kids deserve help, and the kids we work with tend to be under huge amounts of pressure. They tend to feel incredibly anxious, and they, like all kids, need to navigate the world in which they were born. Um, so that's the part that's sort of like the obvious part. And then there's all the work we do with kids who don't have access to that. So. We've tried this in many different iterations, but for me, the most powerful way to do pro bono work is to either um, do exactly what we do for our private students, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, but with students who can't afford it, which we do at lots of schools in New York City, um, but also to give away free information. I think we haven't figured out a great way to do that, but access to good information is something all of our clients have, and it's free. Um, if you know me. <laughs> and so we've, I'd like to make that something that I can give away more easily. Um, and then also access to practice tests and materials. Um, we're hosting mock tests and info sessions and things like that. So we're committed to doing a lot of pro bono work. Um, some of the barriers to that, you know, I want to do good work when I do pro bono work. I want to do good work when I do any work. And so you have to make sure that when you're training your tutors and all the materials you give your tutors and all the support, that they're going to do a good job with kids who sometimes have, um, you know, systemic obstacles to consistently doing their homework or to showing up for practice tests or their parents aren't involved in, in the program. And that makes it harder. So we're working on how we can be better with different groups of kids um, and certainly we're working on expanding the pro bono work we do so more kids have access to the amazing people who uh, tutor at Tutor Associates. Just to ask you um, yourself, is there anything that we left out or didn't ask that you think um, is worth talking about? No, I mean, I think to reiterate, like, I think it matters if you're a rising senior versus a rising junior, a rising sophomore. You know, if you're a rising senior, I do think it's a very special year, but I wouldn't count on things being so different for those kids who are rising juniors and below. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. I do think test optional is here for now, but I don't think it's here to stay. Um, otherwise, you know, I think my message is just for kids to, to try to be good to themselves. They, they, grown-ups don't even know what to do right now um, and so uh, where I think it's important that you guys give yourselves lots of um, care and rest and bike rides and all those things um, as you navigate this yeah all right thank you so much you're definitely a very admirable and uh, inspiring figure for for us and uh, you're doing a lot of good and uh I guess a very stressful field, you know, so. Oh, well, back at you guys. I mean, I was not doing this when I was your age. I was just like a camp counselor. So I think you guys are also admirable and I'm really impressed with this and I, your questions were outstanding. Um, so I'm excited to, to hear this and to keep listening to your podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll definitely keep everything you said in mind as I uh, get back studying on the SAT. Please do. And you have my email. You can email me anytime. I'll give you the inside scoop on everything. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.